Um, I'd like to start out by dedicating this meeting to um, Chris Treadway and to Grace McNeil. Chris, who died recently, was our vice president, and he really was you know, really the, the heart and soul of the Historical Society. He um, just knew so much about Elsewhere history and was such a valuable person in, in spreading the word, word about it. And Grace, a longtime city librarian, was just a wonderful, wonderful person, just so bright. And she really kept the society going in a day before we were moved to City Hall. We, you know, she let us store our archives at the library. She was a very um, powerful person and, and, and really wonderful. And I also wanted to thank Joanne Rubio, who was a board member for about a decade and who was such an expert in the history of the Castro family. And she really brought a spirit of, uh, of community to the society, putting on events, tea dances, events honoring longtime El Cerrito pioneers. She just really cared about people and, 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 and honoring them and ha having them have uh, an enjoyable time. Um, our treasurer has not yet uh, been able to log on. When she does, if she does uh, in time, we will have a um, treasurer's report. Oh yeah, here's our, uh, our wonderful agenda. Um, several members of the board are here and I do want to introduce them. Uh, John Falconer, who's at the top, you see El Cerrito Historical Society. He's running the show from a technical viewpoint and he does all of our technical stuff and it's just great having him. And more than that, he's a long time uh, El Cerrito He's a native. He knows a lot about the town. Uh, Diane Brenner is a longtime Elsa Reedon. She's been um, involved in so many different efforts in town involving the library, friends of the Cerrito Theater. And, um, you know, it's, it's just great to have her on, on the board. Um, we have several other board members. Uh, Tom Panis could not be here. He's quite expert in the history. Pat Durham, who's trying to log on. Uh, she's the organizer of the Martin Luther King Parade and has done so much else for town. Uh, in the town. And Pat Shaw, with a background in banking, is our uh, dependable, dependable uh, treasurer. Moving on in the agenda, I wanted to talk very briefly about some of the goals and accomplishments. You know, it's been kind of a hard year. I'll keep this kind of short. We have long goals, many accomplishments, and they're posted on the website. But keeping it short, you know, we haven't had too many meetings because of the uh, pandemic. The last real meeting we have, we had, it was January 2019, where we had about 125 people. It was about Pumpsy Green, who integrated the Red Sox. In uh, 2020, we had two Zoom meetings. Uh, Pat Durham and uh, some uh, friends of hers, uh, Mina Wilson, put on a program about the history of the Martin Luther King Parade in El Cerrito, a more dramatic history than you might imagine. And we also had our, our um, annual meeting at the start of 2020, was a history of Hambone Kelly's, a great jazz club, uh, put on by Chris Sturba, a historian and a member. Um, we did some pretty good publications this year. We did two copies of the Forge. We aimed at four, but two wasn't bad. And both had really thorough historical studies about the very earliest members of the black community who played an important role regionally, some of them. We are, work, our, our Sparks keeps coming out monthly, our email newsletter, we have some pretty interesting stories in, in there. Upcoming, we have a really good uh, oral history and article coming out about a guy named Gerald Martin, who is a pioneering black resident here in town, uh, who's had a really interesting life story. I think you'll be interested in learning about it. He was one of the founding members of a local branch of the NAACP. We did, I don't know if you guys get the Chamber of Commerce newsletter, but they had a really good article written by me and sponsored by the Historical Society about the history of everyone's favorite hardware store, Pastime, which began not with hardware, but guess what, as a, as a tavern. It's almost 100 years old. We'll be running a longer version of that in Forge next year. We've done a fair amount of research assistance this year. Even though our archive is closed to the public, we've been working with researchers. Uh, two of the more interesting ones, um, there's a movie coming out about Credence Clearwater, by a really good filmmaker. And uh, there's an, another book coming out and we've uh, helped out uh, both of those. I don't know if anybody caught Neighborhood Stories. It was a local theatrical producer who during the height of the pandemic, when people couldn't go to plays, she did plays and performances outdoors. It had a strong historical component and we supplied a lot of that uh, history. Well, next year, one of the main things that's 
happening, and I think it's quite interesting, it's the Recycling Center's 50th anniversary. It's a really historical place in town. Very few cities have recycling centers at all. And just about none have some as extensive and really that just does as much as, as ours. The history is real, real interesting. And we're going to honor the person who did more than anybody else to ensure that unlike most recycling centers founded in the early 70s, it still exists. And that's Joel Witherell, the late Joel Witherell, who was the city's uh, head of um, community services for the first 20 years of the recycling center's existence. He really kept it going. He put his heart and soul on that. So we're going to have several events, including one on August 5th, which is the 50th anniversary of the first day the recycling center went into service. It should be a really great event. We'll be doing more researching. We'll be doing more performances. We're going to get back to archiving. We haven't been doing much archiving because we've lost our archivists. We'll be doing that too. And if all goes well, we'll be getting back to live programs. We don't have a big attendance tonight so far, and our Zoom meetings have not attracted big attendances, but our live events always did. We always did good with live events, okay? So we'll be getting back to that soon. At this point, what I'd like to do is open it to the floor. We do have several people in attendance tonight, and so, oh yeah, I wanted to thank people too, but before that, let me open it to the floor. Are there any questions? comments or anything like that, feel free to uh, raise your hand or just speak. I think, John, you can unmute people. I'll give uh, a I, couple can, seconds. Hmm? I can suggest, but I think if they hear me, uh, they will know they can unmute themselves. Okay. So what do you think? Anybody have any comments? Okay. In that case, go back to, uh, uh, I just want to thank, you know, we, we've had a fair number of donors this year. Oh, John, could you scroll that down to the thank you page? Yeah, we had some, you know, significant uh, donations of, of funds. Marvin Collins, Joe Paulino, Rich Barkey, Christy Wessenberg, and Lynn Mack. And I'm not going to read through all the donations. But we've had some interesting donations that have come in, and we always want more. You know, in working with the Credence guys, who want material about Credence, they want stuff from the 60s. We don't have much stuff from the 60s. Joe Paulino just gave us some, but we don't have much. So anybody who has material, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, anything like that, we need donations. Okay, turning now to the meat and potatoes of our meeting. This is the election of officers. We are required by law to have this meeting. Not that we wouldn't do it anyhow, because we like doing meetings, but we're required by law to have this meeting and to elect officers. Now, we are putting a slate before you, and... I'm the president, Diane Brenner, secretary, our treasurer, Pat Shaw. Tom Pattis, John Falconer, and Pat Durham are at-large members. We have no one on our slate in the vice president's uh, slot. I see several people in attendance who I believe will make good vice presidents. And you are allowed to nominate yourself. So I'm going to pause for a minute. And by the way, you don't have to join us as the vice president. We have other open slots in at large. So if anybody wants to nominate themselves, think about it and then do it. If you want to get more involved with the society, oh, it's, it's easy to do, yes, but yes. If you want to be more involved with the society, there are many other ways short of joining the board. We need people to help with the archiving. We need people to do, you know, to write for our email newsletter and for Forge, our print newsletter. We need people to do research, to help do programs, to lean on city officials who aren't being nice to us. There are so many things. There are things I'm not even thinking of that if you want to do, you could do with and for the society. So think about that, and we're easy to reach. Get back to us. I'm not seeing anybody rushing to nominate, so I'm gonna figure that ain't happening. Poll is still open. If anybody has a nomination or wishes to make a nomination, let us know, please. Well, hearing no nominations from the floor, I am going to uh, offer to the members. And if you are a member, you can vote. And if you're not a member, then don't vote. But 
I'll leave it to uh, the honor system as to whether you are. Okay, so we have a slate of officers. We're not going to vote individually, but all those in favor of the slate of officers, uh, John is going to put up a place you can click and just click yes. Yep, hang on here. We're moving mice between screens. There we go. Okay, John, John will tabulate the, vo the votes, giving people a minute or two to, um, I'll be right back. I'll leave the poll open for another 30 seconds or so while Dave takes a little walk. Okay, John, do we have the uh, votes tabulated? I will provide you with the results. We had one negative vote and ah. six positive votes. Great, well, I guess it carries. It does carry. All right, um, so at this point, hey, six o'clock on the dot, dot, that's great. At this point, I'm gonna give uh, uh, the program, and you know, if, if Pasha manages to come on, we could um, do the treasurer's report later on. Okay. Now, one hint I may give people who are viewing, uh, Dave formatted this presentation uh, in a fashion that's sort of like typewriter paper rather than as a PowerPoint, which means it's taller than wide. But if you're viewing on a phone, you could be able to use your fingers to just enlarge the size and fill the screen. So just a tip for you. Okay, my presentation, oh, are, are we recording this? Yes. We are. Okay, my presentation tonight, this afternoon, is about our greatest historic neighborhoods. One of the things that I do for a hobby, mm -hmm. and also kind of for a living, because I write about Eichler Homes, is walk around neighborhoods and I really, enjoy doing that, looking at the houses. And it's surprising how when you do that, you can actually learn quite a bit of history if you're observant and, uh, you know, just, just pay attention. Uh, next slide, next page. Okay, so I'm saying this is kind of the typical El Cerrito house. This one's on Clayton, it was built in 1943 and it has no particular style. You, it's not a craftsman house, it's not a Victorian style, it's not Egyptian, it's not, French farmhouse. It's just, you know, kind of a standard. Some people call them, you know, kind of... Uh, your speaker is not working. Please check your connection or use a different speaker. Uh, I can hear you fine, Dave. Okay, um, I, this is, I, I only have one, one speaker. I don't have another one. Can, can other people hear me okay? I hear you great. I can hear you fine. So you get that worked out, I'll put it, turn it on. So it's the speaker right here, real tech. Hi. Ah, it's Bob and Gail, are you guys in? That's working. Well, let me ask, um, and how many people can hear me? Could, could you raise your hand? I can hear you fine. Okay, I, I, I think maybe the person who's having trouble um, could have a problem on, on, on their end. I'm okay, sure. okay I, I'm gonna keep, keep going, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so as I was saying, this is a pretty standard El Cerrito house. Maybe somebody here lives in this house. I'm sure a lot of people live in some that are like it. You know, it's just kind of a kind of a, a mid-century, mid-century vernacular box of no particular style, but yet you know it has certain charm. I, I like that uh, porch. And one of the things interesting, you got a picture. I like the picture when you walk through a neighborhood and you see a house. What the city was like when the people were were living there. I mean, El Cerrito had several housing booms in the course of its existence. You know, starting in the in the teens, about the time of World War. One. In World War II, it had another housing boom, even though you'll read in history books that residential houses were not built in World War II because there was a lack of building materials. But that was not the case in places like El Cerrito, where there was a lot of war work going on. The federal government made sure that there was plenty of, um, you know, plenty of, of material. Now, this is an interesting period because it was just coming, it's just towards the end of when El Cerrito was a wild nightlife kind of town. In 1939, the 
The biggest, biggest example of gambling, which was the dog track where the plaza is now, that had just gone out of business and turned into war worker houses. So everything was really changing. People who lived in houses like this, besides working in the war effort, you know, earlier, they worked at Tepco Pottery, they worked at Standard Oil. This was a working class town at that time. Uh, next page, please. This is one of the oldest houses in town. Zillow claims it's from 1897. This is the Rodini house. And as you might know, it's in play right now. It was recently picked up and moved to, to the rear of the site and condos are being built alongside of it. And uh, now, so I think some people are talking, if, 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 you're not, if you're not making a presentation, maybe you could uh, mute your, yourself. And so it's basically kind of, kind of a farmhouse that was owned by an Italian family. There's a different pattern of development that you see in El Cerrito than you see in a lot of the other smaller cities in California, where what you'll often see is a compact downtown. And right next to the downtown, there'll be one neighborhood of fine houses where the business owners and managers lived and, you know, kind of big Victorians or early uh, storybook period revival houses. Then there'll be a neighborhood nearby of more working class houses. Whereas if you look at El Cerrito, you walk around, you'll see that most of the earliest houses, although there were some right near downtown, they're scattered about. El Cerrito had more of, uh, of an agrarian, you know, an agrarian farmhouse look than a lot of these other cities. And also El Cerrito did not have one downtown. It had at least three. There was rust or roost at the southern part of town where pastime is. There was Schmidtville, where Schmidt Lane hits uh, San Pablo Avenue. And then there was Steege Junction up where uh, Potrero Avenue was. So three separate little conglomerations of um, you know, stores and, and, and buildings. And many residents at the time raised chickens and goats and they made their own wine. Next picture, please. So if you go to about the corner of Stockton and Ashbury, you'll see this uh, a house, which is a, uh, you know, craftsman, yeah, kind of a craftsman bungalow, and is and is one similar one uh, across the street from it. And this is this was the most popular type of house built in the United States from the mid 19 aughts to about the time of World War uh, One. And you can recognize it because it has like two gables over the front facade, one over the uh, main living area, and another generally over a porch. Although I saw a bunch yesterday in, uh, in Visitation Valley, where instead of a porch right there, you had a uh, living area. So anyhow, you see, you see hundreds of these houses throughout town. And it's, the porch is always supported by posts. The posts in this house are not there anymore. They were replaced by wrought iron. This is the kind of house that grew up out of the arts and crafts tradition of Great Britain in the 19th century, when that was taken up by... Uh, Charles and, um, and Henry Green in Pasadena and really popularized in this country. Next picture, please. This is what's called an American Four Square. It's a neoclassical revival house of the same era as the bungalows. And you also see these scattered throughout town. This one is scattered pretty close to, to my house. It's quite um, a prominent site on the corner of Ashbury and Fairmont. You'll see the classical columns, you see the balustrades. This kind of house often had, as you see here, a central dormer in the, uh, in the roof. Next slide, please. And here is a kind of an interesting house. This is kind of an American Forest Square, kind of a classical revival. This is on Kearney Street. Around, this is an area where you see quite a few of the older houses, 500, 600 blocks. This is from 1906, Zillow says. That strikes me as maybe a little bit early. But what's interesting is kind of a transition house because on the one hand, it has that kind of classical look with the classical Greek style pediment over the front porch. And the house is basically rectangular. But if you look over at the right, there is a window at the side, which is not rectangular, it's cut in at an angle. And that's more of a Victorian, you know, Queen Anne look. And then if you look at the shingles above the porch, in the gable, they're also, you know, more of a, a Victorian thing. So this is kind of one of those houses at, on Kearney Street that's in between the late Victorian and the early neoclassical. Interesting house. I like it. Okay, go on to the next one, please. Here's one of my favorite houses. What a wild house this is. This, it has a gambrel roof, okay, which means that it has two different slopes. 
And also at the bottom of that roof, it kind of bellows out like a bell, kind of an Asian thing. It has those two returns near the top of the gable, those two uh, uh, cornices that kind of shoot inwards. It has a, a kind of a, a, a multi-plane living room there. It has an indented porch. There's an Oriole window to the back on the left. So it's got all these complexities. It's a really complex house, really kind of interesting and fun. 1512 Albemarle Street from about 1916. Okay, next one. And now we have some clusters of late 19th and early 20th century houses. There's quite a few of them on Elm Street, there's Liberty Street, Liberty Street, here, right around here. And this, they claim it's from 1918, but it sure looks a lot earlier to me. Maybe it's a bit of a stylistic throwback. There was the building houses in El Cerrito in 19, that looks like they're from 1902. But this is really, looks a lot like a classic Victorian house with its, you know, triangular bay. But at the same time, you have two different gables, a small one in front and a late one behind that suggests that it has some of that arts and crafts bungalow look. Kind of cool looking house. And they gave it a painted lady paint job. Next one, please. Okay, now this is also a nearby house. And this is Liberty Street. I don't quite have the address. I, might, I must have missed it. And again, it looks kind of like a late Victorian house. Um, although it might be a few years later. The structure alongside the porch, obviously, it was added later. Yeah, hip roof Victorian cottage. Kind of a, lip, a, a working class cottage. Very likely it got lifted up later on. All right, next one, please. And here's another uh, similar variant on the bungalow. Again, it has uh, one, one roof over the living area, a shorter, similar roof over the entryway. It has windows that almost meet at the edge. I wonder if they weren't added. It has the, uh, the eaves held up by, uh, you know, posts. And it's, you know, kind of, kind of a, a cool house. You got a picture that it was mostly small builders who were building in El Cerrito at the time. If you walk around, you don't see many large tracks. If you go into Albany, not hard to do, a guy named Charles Winnale McGregor, he built hundreds and hundreds of homes, mostly in a storybook period revival um, style. They don't, uh, they, it doesn't appear that there was any builder uh, in the teens and 20s building as many houses in groups like that in El Cerrito. You'll see five, six, seven, ten houses maybe grouped together that look like they are built by, by the same person. Okay, next house, please. Now, this is an interesting house. This one, it's hard to say what it is. It's, a, it's an old farmhouse. What it has, it has a partial wraparound porch. I don't know of any other house in El Cerrito. I can't think of any offhand that has a partial wraparound porch. You see a lot of houses like that up in Healdsburg and in the wine country. This appears to be a really well tended for older house, 1538 Lexington. You also have to, I, I like to picture what the town was like. Like this house was built in 1918. Very sparsely populated town, El Cerrito. They were starting to get clusters of homes, but it, it was only the year before that they started getting plumbing. They started putting in sewer pipes. That's when a group of city, city fathers got together and they formed the Steve Sanitary District. The goal was to follow that by incorporating as a city. It took them uh, for, oh, I'm sorry, I, I made a mistake there. L let me take that back. It was 1911 that the sewage district was formed. It was 1917, the year before this was built, that the city was formed. And the sewage district encompassed what is today Kensington and the Richmond Annex. The goal at the time was to have El Cerrito uh, cover those same boundaries, but it didn't happen because some people who lived in the areas that are today Kensington and the Richmond Annex were presumed that it was presumed they would vote no. And so their territories were excluded and El Cerrito ended up being smaller, being the size that it is today. Next slide, please. Now, this is an interesting house too, a bit of an odd duck, 1525 Elm. Zillow says it's from 1926, and that could be correct. It looks like it's much earlier, because as you can t tell by now, I hope, it's, it's, a, it's a California bungalow. 
And bungalows really fell out of fashion fast after World War I. And they were replaced by another style of house we're going to see soon. Now, this is stucco. Most of the bungalows were clapboard wood siding. And so a lot of the late bungalows are made of stucco. Stucco came in as a popular siding material, you know, right after uh, World War I. Uh, now, the, the replacements of these, and we'll see those soon, were a very varied bunch of period revival styles, Spanish colonial, American colonial, French provincial. Some were built really big for people with a, bit, with, with a few bucks. And some were built quite small in small tracks. And at the time, even, they were called modest mansions. OK, let's go on to the next slide. Now, here's an example. This is an interesting house. If you know where Zara Avenue is, it's right about when you're almost in Richmond, very far northern part of town. It's got some, it's a real fun street to walk on. And this and a companion are the oldest houses there. These are the only uh, craftsman bungalows. And I think at this point, you can sort of recognize uh, the style. This is a bit different in that the entry porch has the gable facing front and on the main living area, the gable side. But so you can tell what kind of house it is. Okay, next one, please. Now we've moved from Zara and we are on Yuba, Yuba Street. So around Barrett Avenue, Yuba, Tulare, Elhorst, Charles. That's the neighborhood that El Cerrito has a lot of its grander, but sometimes not so grand, purely revival houses. And this is one of the, uh, you know, Tudor style houses, you see this kind of thing in merry old England. And people say that, oh, people sometimes tell me they were all inhabited by Chevron or Standard Oil at the time, managers. And some probably were, but some were, you know, these are the kind of people who were doing pretty well. And so they can mostly hire architects. A lot of these houses were designed as custom homes by architects. In only a few cases do we know who those architects were. You have both the period revival houses that try to play up the period they were based on in a colorful way. And you also have a company of them, storybook houses, which really played up more of a fantasy land period of Cinderella stories rather than uh, the straight historic. Next one, please. And here's kind of a Spanish Baroque house. This one is on Charles Avenue. And we do know the architect. It was Clarence Tantau. He was a very well-known Bay Area architect. And we do know the client. It was uh, Edward Downer, who was the founder or one of the founders of Mechanics Bank. Quite an attractive house. Next one, please. And here we have kind of a storybook house. The way that roof just slides away at the end over the garage. That's called a cat slide. This house is on Carquina Street. And it's a pretty nice house. It's got that exaggerated gable over the tiny front door. One guy who wrote about Bay Area houses like this, they called them dolls houses. But sometimes they would have contrasted scale. So that whole neighborhood is, is really well worth walking, walking around. Next house, please. Also nearby is this one. It's a small house, but very nice on both the inside and outside. And they incorporated rock and a tiny little window, tiny windows into it. Rock, rock facades. Yeah, El Cerrito was, this is from 1938. <laughs> yeah, 38. 28, sorry. El Cerrito was a real rock town. There were a couple of major quarries and some smaller ones. And there was at least one place that sold rock from other quarries too. Next one, please. And here's a cute house. This is on Brooks Avenue in that same general neighborhood where they really played up the storybook and made it kind of an almost art house by incorporating strange things and bricks, clinker bricks, they called them, into the... Uh, was probably a dining room or a kitchen and the fireplace. Clinker bricks were from brickyards and they were malformed and deformed. And all of a sudden they became really popular, like in the aughts. And people started going out of the way to use clinker bricks just to plate things up. Next one, please. Now we're mo moving into the modest mansions on Poinsett Avenue. This is just down from Poinsett Park. And these are, I wish I knew who the developer was or the architect, but they're really cute houses. They have battlements, they have turrets. This is just about as cute as they come. This, this could easily make a National Register historic district. You have to figure out who, who built them though. Okay, 
Next one, please. So you see, we, we need a lot of volunteers to help us figure these things out. A lot of research could be done in uh, El Cerrito. Next one, please. Now we're moving into the Atwell Tract, which is another, I think, potential National Historic District. I really wish we could work on this one. The House on Top is by Richard Neutra, who's one of the founders of modern architecture, you know, along with Mies van der Rohe. He's from Vienna. He came out to California in the 20s to work with Wright, formed his own firm in LA, and he invented a kind of California modernism right out here, and it's you know, pretty amazing. The Atwell, who was a pharmacist on um, Solano Avenue. No, no, Fairmont, Fairmont. Uh, he had a bunch of land there, because land didn't cost much, like in the early 50s. And I'm not sure what the history was. I'm going to say he subdivided it, but I think to some extent the Atwell track is not subdivided. And I believe, I might be wrong about this. Tell me if you live in one of these houses. There's a lot of houses there. It might still be a single property where it's owned by the homeowners association and homeowners own their own houses. The houses below it came in many years later and they're not too pretty. But anyhow, Neutra, that's who he was. Okay, uh, next one, please. And here's another house that's part of the Atwell track. This was designed by Don Hardison, who was an El Cerrito architect, a very important architect. He just did all kinds of building all over the, the Bay Area. If you know Zellerbach Hall and that hall complex at the university, his firm did that. Um, he, he, you know, a real important architect. He designed a lot of the park buildings in town. Um, and his house is just quite, quite lovely. It's what they today call mid-century modern. And it's one of the more, um, I think, important houses in, in the city. He and his wife Betty were very much involved with community affairs, both here and in uh, Richmond. Uh, next one, please. Oh yeah, Henry Hill, one of my favorite Berkeley architects. I just love his work. He did a, a number of houses in El Cerrito, but did he ever do one as nice as this one? I don't know. This is a house on Vista Road, also in the Atwell track. And you know, he he would he would like paint walls purple. He would use gold leaf. He would use mirrors. He did. He would use louvers to cast shadows. He really was kind of a broke baroque mid-century modernist. And this house, besides having kind of a fun hall of mirrors aspect to the interior. Next one, please. Also had this. And I say had, I hope it still has. I, I was here over a decade ago when it was for, for sale. Incorporating mosaics, what looks like a, a tiki boat over an indoor pool. And, you know, there's mosaics in the floor. And just really complicated uh, rock walls. I've seen Henry Hill houses where people buy them. They go in and they take out all the texture and they paint everything white. I've actually seen that. It's, it's brought tears to my eyes. Next one, please. Okay, the East Shore community is not a neighborhood that I think everybody in El Cerrito knows because it's the only part of El Cerrito that is on the other side of I-80 and therefore a lot of people don't go to it. It's you know shoved up against Richmond. If you walk more than a few blocks into it, you're actually in Richmond. It's kind of between Petrero, I-80 and Booker T. Anderson Park was used to be called East Shore Park. Most of the homes got built in the 50s and 60s. It was largely a black neighborhood for a long time. Pat Durham, our um, board member who lives there, has told me that it's changed a lot and there are far fewer black people living there, including on her street. This is the house that her father built. He was a well-known um, uh, entrepreneur in the business of building materials demolition and sales. He did quite well, well enough to build this really interesting mid-century modern house using a black architect named um, Sherman Workman. So it's quite a lovely house. And it's, you know, one of the stars, 512, 5212 Cypress Avenue. Next um, one, please. That neighborhood does have a few older houses, including this bungalow, which is apparently from 1914 and is you know, it's kind of interesting. It looks like there's been some changes to the front window. Next house, please. Also in that neighborhood are a group of houses like these. You see some of these in nearby Richmond. And these are mid-century modern, very simple mid-century modern houses. I don't know much about them. I suspect, and I like to learn, that they may have been designed by Don Hardison. He and his firm did hundreds and hundreds of houses in South Richmond in areas that at one point 
have been occupied by warehouses that was built both for white workers and black workers. When the housing went up during the war, not just around here, but a lot of places, the realty boards did what they could to ensure that they would be temporary houses because they wanted them gone. They didn't want there to be these kind of people living around. And so after the war, you had to replace them. And Don Hardison was really proud of the work he did in South Richmond. He really thought they helped build communities there. And he was quite, quite proud of that. You know, when it comes to mid-century houses, these were mid-century workers' houses. The budget wasn't great. They were small. They had to cut corners. They had to do more than cut corners. But he was quite proud of a lot of the work he did. You know, I wish I knew if these were Don's or not, but, you know, there's quite a few of them around. And some are in El Cerrito. Next one, please. Okay, now we're up in the area of Villanueva, which is uh, on the Arlington, above the Arlington, and it's adjacent to Camp Herms. This is one of El Cerrito's most amazing neighborhoods of mid-century modern houses. This was designed by Claude Oakland better known for designing many, many houses for the track builder, Joe Eichler, in a mid-century modern style. They don't look like this, because this was built for T.Y. Lynn, whose firm, T.Y. Lynn International, is very important. And he was legendary during his time as a uh, engineer using pre-stressed concrete. The house is built of pre-stressed concrete, not surprising. Next one, please. And it had, or has, a... Um, Ballroom, because he and his wife, T.Y., were ballroom dancers. Diane Brenner, a member of our board, has told me that she believes the buyer of this house has since subdivided the ballroom to make more bedrooms. And that's too bad, but I guess not everybody needs a ballroom in their house. Okay, next one, please. Here's another house in that neighborhood. Uh, I can't say much about it. I wish I knew more. It's a nice house. The walls of glass that in a Eichler would have looked out at a private backyard here instead taking the view, and it has the open beams. And this kind of house, even though it's modern, it, it derives some of its thinking from the arts and crafts tradition, the kind of woodsy look, the open beams, the open to nature. And that's one reason why it's so bad when people paint them all white. Many, many houses like this in the El Cerrito Hills, it's one of our treasures. Next one, please. Now we're still in that neighborhood, and this is Don, a house on Don Carroll Drive, that has a kind of Asian aspect. I like how they use kind of a screen-like effect to break up the view and make it more dramatic in a way. Um, 50s, 60s house, I don't know the date. Next one, please. Here's that same house as seen by, see from the outside. So it's got a wall of glass, kind of a Japanese aspect too. Next one, please. Okay, now we're in a whole nother mid-century modern neighborhood. Except this neighborhood is not just mid-century modern. It blends the mid-century modern houses with modern houses of other ilks, including at least one Tudor. And this neighborhood, Mira Vista Country Club Estates, across from the Country Club, you know a little bit about. It was designed, not designed, but it was built by R.E. Meadows, who in the 50s and 60s and into the 70s just did scads of houses throughout town. There's some near the recycling center. This, we really did quite a few. And I, I've been working to try to figure out where they all are. And this is on Pebble, Pebble Beach. It's a really cool house. There's a little bridge that accesses, accesses the front door through a, a garden and a little, I don't know, Japanese style creek. Okay, next one, please. Oh yeah, so Ari Meadows may have been a great guy, but he discriminated against black people in the selling of his house. And that was really common. That's why, you know, when the um, research I just did was about Gerald Martin, I told you about the guy who moved to El Cerrito in, in, in the 50s with his family. He was prosperous. He was a really, really nice guy. And he had a good job. He couldn't buy a house here. It really took him um, a long time. He eventually had to buy uh, a piece of land. And he had to use the kind of realtor who some people would call blockbusters because they would sell to black people in white neighborhoods. And don't think white people in this neighborhood didn't object and try to buy them out and try to get them out of there. And they did. But here it says that R.E. Meadows uh, was sued by the Congress of Racial Inequality because two white people went to a house and they could buy it. A black person went there and could not. Now, this was not in the neighborhood I'm talking about, Mara Vista. It was in some other neighborhood. Now, I don't know where it is. I think it's called, what is it called? Uh, Anyhow, 
or Portola Park. I'm not sure what his Portola Park subdivision is. But that was just the way of life for um, black people in El Cerrito at the time. And, and it's worth noting that this occurs the same year that the Byron Rumford Act passed the California legislature and was signed into law by the governor, which made discrimination in housing uh, illegal. Next one, please. There it is, Mary Vista Country Club Estates. One of the very few neighborhoods in town that has a sign like that. There aren't too many others. So that's my quick run through of neighborhoods in El Cerrito. If I missed yours, well, I missed mine. There's a lot of good ones and El Cerrito is really pays to walk around. And I wish we had time, wish I had time and maybe someone could join me to learn more about the history of our neighborhoods. So at that point, I will cease my uh, speech and open it up to comments, questions, or anything else anybody else wants to say. Thank you. If you're muted and are speaking, we won't hear you. Well, hearing one. Oh, oh, good. Big, oh, big just, just a quick one. I know you're recording this presentation. Is it going to be available on the website? Oh, yes. We're going to put it on the website in two ways. One, Great. we're going to post the actual PDF. Mm -hmm. That way you can look at, that, look at it without hearing me talk. Mm -hmm. Think of that. But we're also, <laughs> also going to post my presentation as well. So there's two ways. That'll, go probably on, that'll be on our YouTube channel, but there will be a link to it from the website as well. Great. Thank you. Well, let me ask this. Does anybody present live in one of these houses or one of these neighborhoods that we discussed tonight? Well, as you know, I live in one of the neighborhoods that you just talked about. So it's what's actually, it like, Diane? Do people like it? Sorry? So what's, what's the neighborhood like? Is it a friendly place? Do people Are people proud of their houses? It's a pretty interesting neighborhood. It's a very friendly neighborhood. We've lived in this neighborhood for about 26 years now. When we arrived here, a lot of the original owners were still here. We bought our house from the original owner. And we knew one of the houses that you showed on there was in my block. And um, that owner was here for a long, long time until about a year ago. But um, yeah, people have, usually people would stay here for a really long time. Now that's kind of changing, but it, it's a very, it's a nice neighborhood. We like it. Everything here was built in the late 50s, late 1950s. Okay. My neighborhood uh, includes a variety of different homes, some that were built in the 30s, but then a number that were built in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And it's an interesting mix because you'll have a sort of conventional clapboarded bungalow-like house next to, say, my house, which is a mid-century modern uh, designed by Roger Lee. And then you go down the hill and it's a, uh, what would have been considered maybe a, a ranch house uh, next to us. So a very varied neighborhood. One thing that I didn't say that I think might be worth making a point about, if you do what I did at one point, which is to go through old copies of the El Cerrito Journal from the teens and twenties, they kept on saying, El Cerrito is a boom town. It's booming and booming and booming and more and more houses are being built. And they did that because it was true to some extent but also they were boosters and they wanted people to think that and they wanted to attract more builders to town. But if you look at a lot of the neighborhoods, like for example, right near where I live in the St. Jerome area, you know, south of St. Jerome, the south of Fat Apples, the various early houses were built there in the teens, in the late teens. That's when it was subdivided. But if you walk through that neighborhood and look now, most of the houses are from the 20s and 30s. So what that means is that the place sat kind of empty for a decade or more and houses weren't getting built. And, you know, you see that a lot. Or do you guys know where the friend estate is, that really big house that's hard to see because there's so many trees around it. It's on a really big lot right across the street from um, Arlington Park. Sure. Oh, exactly well, yeah. Had, so had donkeys for out. years and years when I was a child. What, what was that? I say they, they had donkeys there for years and years. Oh, that's not. 
That's back that, when it was right across from what at the time was a uh, a stable. Okay. Which now is Arlington Park. All right. See, John knows a lot. Now that house was the friend estate, George Friend, and he was building houses around me. And apparently it was going to be called Friend Estates. So we know this. And we even have in our collection an old sign from the Friend office. But yeah, if you walk around there in that neighborhood, you don't see too many houses from the 20s. He was starting that development right about the time that was today Camp Herms stopped being a quarry. You know, it wouldn't have been a good place to build houses right across the street from a quarry where they're using dynamite to get rocks out of the hill. And so just about the time that Cam Hearns got built, that's when he started building. And if you're on the Arlington and you go up Mosier and you turn left on the Arlington and you walk or drive north, you'll see a couple of like kind of entry displays, you know, kind of brick uh, arches. Arlington Estates. Yeah. And so... I mean, I'm not sure, maybe you know, John, but I'd always assumed, or at least I assume now, that they were put in by George Friend, the way a lot of fancy 1920s and 30s housing projects put in those entry gateways and that kind of thing. Yeah, That's I don't I know the answer to that. I know that the uh, the tract, if you go and look at the, uh, the city, city and county's tracts of land, that the area that's below the Arlington from that point forward is all referred to as Arlington Estates. Okay. And that's what those uh, entry portals used to denote. Okay. So was there any indication as to when the estates got laid out? I well, wouldn't be making a guess, but my guess is going to be in the mid-30s. Okay. Yeah, I, I knew the owners who built one of those houses, and they built it in 1937. Yeah. All right. Yeah. The house next to us, for example, was built in 38. One across the street was built in 37. And it was like many other neighborhoods up in the hills here. There were lots that remained open um, for a decade or more after the first homes went in. So you had occasionally uh, very different looks seated, seated next to one another. Well, you know, you see that in the flatlands too. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, for example, where, where you'll see a mid-century modern house in the flatlands, it's a weird sight. <laughs> I don't mean a weird sight to look at. I mean a weird sight of life. Exactly. For example, right in my neighborhood on Pomona or Ramona, you'll see mid-century modern houses right alongside, you know, uh, Cerrito Creek. You know, those parcels that people didn't want to build in, build on back in the 20s and 30s. And you'll see mid-century modern houses in kind of oddball, Lots of land in, in, in the low hills, too. So, yeah, it's fun to walk around El Segundo. I could have done this whole talk, throwing out all these neighborhoods and putting in other ones, too. There was no shortage of neighborhoods. All right, well, I'm getting tired of talking. As, as I was telling the members of the board, I don't really, I, I feel funny doing Zoom talks because I feel, sort of feel like I'm talking to nobody, you know what I mean? I, I much prefer either doing live talks, even better, hikes. I really prefer doing hikes. But they're, they're more, more informal. You know. So anyhow, uh, I'll give a couple more minutes to see if there's any more comments and questions. And otherwise, I'll just thank everybody for having come. We didn't get that better turnout. We'll have we got about 16. That's not so bad. It could have been worse. Um, and I do hope we have some live events. We got some good ones. We have some good ones lined up for 2020. Speaking of buildings. We had some we had, great ones that got postponed as well. We had Earl Flattop Smith. What was that, John? I say we had some great ones lined up that we, I hope, will be able to bring back to life once we get uh, people able to sit next to one another again. Right. That's getting no butter. Hmm? So I have a question. Sure. Uh, this is Fran Capaletti. I'm a member, but I live in East Richmond Heights, which we almost could be El Cerrito a few years back, but still or not. I, I'm just curious, when you do your research, are there act, things like building permits where you can find the architect or are there kind of, is, are records available or is it a difficult process to research? I've had very poor luck um, using the El Cerrito permits to find architects. So often, either, the, either I don't find anything there 
I mean, there's nothing there, or there's there's some permits, but they don't list the architect. Or sometimes, sometimes like this, like like for my house, the only permit is like from a 1960s, what do you call it, um, remodeling. So it's it's kind of sporadic what I found so far. You know, we, we we're not like Berkeley. Berkeley uh, architectural heritage, and Fran is a volunteer there. At some point, I forget how they did it, but they got all the old permits from the city and they have it in their office and they have them sort of cataloged in, in certain ways. So it's very easy. You know, we have to go to City Hall or, and, and some of them they have online too, but you still have to go to City Hall. I don't think they're available, you know, from your home website. They weren't last time. And so it's, it's kind of difficult. That's where I would add, uh, I do work there and we have uh, records digitized from 1909 to 46, which is a great, Great asset, but if you go before 1909, you really have to do a lot of guesswork and go back to old tax assessments and, and so forth. For those who are interested in nailing that detail down, but thanks. All right. Any more questions? Otherwise, we're gonna go have a comment if you don't mind. Oh, of course, comment. We love comment. Yeah, this is Bob Chipola from Santa Rosa. My parents. Uh, hello to Pam and uh, Fars. Uh, uh, Pam, Pam Winter did the landscaping for my house after we rebuilt from the 2017 fires up here. Uh, but uh, anyway, it's about my parents' house on 2507 Harris Avenue, El Cerrito, right below the uh, uh, Poinsett Park area. And that, uh, you know, the hillside, hillside runs right into Harris Avenue where those storybook homes were with the turrets and all that. So, so the, there, there are a number of really interesting homes there. And I could provide some information on my parents' house. They lived there for 45 years. And I, I won't do it right now, but by email, I could help provide some information. Uh, the architect that built or designed their house also designed one in uh, Petaluma uh, that's still there and, and, and looking quite good. So uh, yeah, there's tremendous, uh, tremendous architecture in El Cerrito. One more thing I wanted to mention is someone um, mentioned uh, an architect that I'm, I'm not sure if it was Lee, um, the name, the last name was Lee, but I, when I heard it, it, it triggered something. Lyman G and Jack Anderson worked for that architect that you had mentioned and, and did a lot of, of the modern looking style uh, homes in El Cerrito, you know, the flat roof or the, or the slightly sloped roof and the, the, a lot of redwood and all, but uh, yep. I wish I could remember what that name was of that pretty well-known, he was a Chinese, Fellow. Roger Roger Lee, he Roger actually Lee, grew right. up in Berkeley, Yeah, uh, was best friends with my dad from third grade on, and uh, he designed this home, and I have, of course, all the engineering drawings and all that, which is a, sort of a treat. His two boys uh, both went to El Cerrito High and are both active here in El Cerrito still. Great, yeah. So anyway, I have Jack Anderson, who was, he and, and Lyman G were kind of understudies to uh, to Mr. Lee. And, uh, uh, I have a lot of Jack's uh, watercolor artistry in my house. And he, he, was a, he was a great friend, even though he was quite a bit older than I was, if, you know, so. Well, anyway, thank you for sharing. Yeah, you know, this, this is a great thing. I'm really happy I tuned in and don't want to dominate the conversation. Just thank you all for what you're doing. Yeah, thanks, and, and, and do email some information. I'd be interested to know more about and it. And where would I send it? Oh, well, so we have, we can send it to David S, as in Sam Weinstein at yahoo.com. But if you go on our website also, we have, we have, a, we have a, a EC historical IG. Right, right. I just brought up a page. I don't, I think I'm still sharing so you could see it. But this is ways to contact us. There's the mailing address. There's a shoddy room, which right now is in suspension because of the uh, pandemic. But here's our email address right here, and you just click on that, and it'll open up a uh, an email for you. What a great thrill it was to enjoy Sundar Shadi's uh, displays every year, huh? And, oh, and what a treat! What yeah. a treat! Yeah. And what a traffic jam! Yeah, for sure. So anyway, you just what I'm showing on the screen right now is our website, and uh, there's a lot to explore there. And if you haven't gone to it, it's perhaps not the best organized website in the world, but there is a great depth of material, including interviews with people who are no longer with us. Um, so I encourage you to take a look if you haven't. Thank you. Okay, it was a quarter to seven. This has been a long meeting. So I think at this point, 
unless somebody really wants to say something, I'm going to have to close it out and say goodbye. And I do appreciate you all coming. I would encourage anybody interested in Nelson Rio history to contact us. If you want to help out, if you have any questions, we'd like to provide uh, research assistance. And we have a good archive. So, okay. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dave. Um, the second, second month of the year. Enjoy.